All right, welcome everyone to the 86 Forever preseason roundtable for 2021. This is our first time doing it in video format, but I think we're excited to try this out and have some fun with it. In the past, I guess people who have been reading for a while will be familiar with our, uh, our written pieces where we kind of broke it down segment by segment, position by position, storyline by storyline. So we're kind of going to do something similar this year, but it's going to be all of us just kind of chatting about it, getting our takes for the upcoming season. And no better time, really, because Kayo Alessandra, I'm, I don't know, I'm going back and forth on exactly how to pronounce it, but a big signing this morning. Bruno Gaspar earlier this week. It's a, it's a good time to be a Whitecaps fan. It's a good time to be talking Whitecaps. So I think in this one, we're going to kind of dive into things position by position and uh, I guess opening thoughts. Any, let's go. Let's go. Like gut reaction to the Alexander signing from this morning. Uh, what are people's thoughts on that? We'll just get right into it on on that note. I feel like I, I wrote this in in one of my columns, but he seems like it, Alexander seems like, like Alexandra. I like. I don't know. I, I took French, not Portuguese, so this is going to take a little getting used to. I was gonna say you but, have to say it like your gold member from the Austin Powers movie, <laughs> Alexandra. Alexandra. Okay. Well, however the hell you pronounce his name, he seems like exactly the kind of signing you make if a DP number ten that we've all waited for is not coming until later on in the transfer window. Like, I mean, I think Sam, uh, Sam you kind of hit the nail on the head with your column or your your article looking at how the Caps can succeed without a number ten. And you need a player like Caleb was saying who can who can progress the ball. And I think it's exciting because he does a lot of what Leonard Owusu was intended to do. Just he does it a lot better. <laughs> Which, after watching Owusu at the end of last season, I think everyone can kind of get on board with. Well, something I, I guess I'll I'll throw in there about kind of the the Owusu comparisons is what I really like about this. Um, and I think of two guys in particular when they brought in Kaya was Ryan Raposo and Leonard Wusu because those are guys that can play that number 10, probably like in a sub role more where they'd come in, you know, you're trying to switch up tactics and you bring one of those guys in. And part of Wusu's problem last year, I felt like, was that he was miscast a lot of the time, playing really deep, you know, doing a lot of the physical work. He's not necessarily like that physically strong on the ball. And if he's just having to tackle and hustle in the midfield all the time, it kind of takes away his best attributes, I feel like. So it just provides so much more tactical flexibility. Like they can they can look to attack on the wings now. They can, you know, rely on whether it's Bakel and Alessandra beside each other, whether it's Baldissimo, whether they're playing a three-man midfield. It's just, it's opened up those possibilities. And I feel like, asking less out of guys like Raposo and Owusu maybe will allow them to flourish a little bit more than last year. So, you know, I, I think not only can it just improve the squad in terms of adding a good player, but I feel like it might open up some other guys as well. Yeah, I mean, I'd say personally, like, I think the signing of Alexandra would probably work really well for a higher level team is like a good signing. But for the Whitecaps, it's, a, it's like, it's a great signing almost. Uh, but, like, it's not the signing we're, like, desperately needing at the moment, which is what is really confusing. But, I mean, the more the merrier. Yeah, I think I saw on Twitter today, I, was, I can't remember the account, but someone was like, this is good news that we're not seeing everyone at the former club saying good riddance. Like, thank goodness the player is gone. Finally, there was a club that was actually really disappointed to see a player move on. So, if, if that's an indicator of a successful transfer, then I think it's it's passed in that regard. At the same time, though, I, I remember, like, all the Venezuelan fans saying Anthony Blondell was going to take NLS by storm. So you can't Blondell's always, the truth. Yeah, you can't always rely on what the fans of the previous clubs say. But it is a good sign that they're sad that he's leaving. Well, it was interesting to me that we went into the Brazilian market because that's not one that the Caps have tapped a lot, setting Lucas Venuto and that whole train wreck aside. You know, it's usually been Argentina, Uruguay, Chile – have been, you know, three that we'd mined more and they've branched out Colombia, obviously. So, and, and, and I think what, um, like Seattle has, and now FC Cincinnati have made big Brazilian signings and it's interesting to see the Caps kind of branch out and, and, and join that list a little bit. 
Yeah, it's definitely one of those once every five or six years sort of things, isn't it? I, I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting because I do, from what I've been hearing, there is the possibility that they're they're looking into that Brazilian market for the for the number ten as well. So some guys that we ne- we haven't heard about yet, but I think that are kind of on the radar of the cap. So um, you know maybe with their new scouting staff, they've got some better resources down there now to actually get good intel. Whereas before, you know. It's been brought up a lot, but you know, YouTube, Wikipedia was essentially their scouting staff. So not having to rely on that. I know a lot of the developmental leagues down in South America too, like the data, the video that's available is terrible. So unless you have good contacts and you're really like in the know, it can be really hard to figure out the players that you want. That's that's partially where MDS was coming from, wasn't it? Unless I'm mistaken. Like that well, so, was... so he he coached a bit in Brazilian youth leagues. I think it's like two or three years he spent down there and was was pretty successful. So, you know, you hope that he's been able to capitalize on some of those contacts. But maybe the problem was that everything he was doing up until recently was like he had to go do it himself. Like I remember him and Phil Dos Santos were in Sweden or Denmark like in 2019 in the in the summer scouting some guy on a break right they like they had to physically go and do the scouting work themselves and they don't have to do that anymore so i think it it opens them up to you know use a lot more of their connections albeit with covid and everything that's going on it might be a bit limited but yeah i think they're they're finally getting to kind of put some of that to good use yeah at least they have that familiarity with you know the systems um i mean not that they're necessarily complex i wouldn't know one way or the other but the good thing is is that I'm assuming uh, Dos Santos does, and whether or not he has connections, he has an understanding as to what those youth systems look like when it comes to actually yeah, going absolutely. after potential like prospects. For sure, well, yeah. When they they were scouting uh, Alexandra, you're gonna just go with that. They they were scouting him for a, a long time, and I mean that's a welcome change of pace too. Same with um, Casado, where it feels less like we are throwing darts on a map and playing pick a league worldwide and we're going to go find a guy, you know, they are actual transfer targets and it's kind of crazy that it's taken this many years in MLS to reach that point, but it's, you know, there's more. And also, I mean, talking about MDS, I mean, he's been signing a lot of Portuguese speaking guys, which can only help with getting them integrated, especially in this weird Utah based season. I think also it's kind of interesting that they've chosen to uh, target Brazil as a market because, like, typically speaking, uh, it, it's just the way of the world. Like, some countries paying for players from there, there's a premium on them. Uh, and Brazil and Argentina typically are, like, the premium markets in South America. That's where players there cost a few million more than they would if they came from a less, a less prestigious South American country. Typically, it's Colombia, Uruguay, Paraguay. Uh, those countries that you would be like looking for players in because players from there might have like the same level of ability as an Argentinian or a Brazilian, but they, they cost less because they're just, they just have less cachet. So I think it's interesting that they're diving into some like more expensive markets, which is a, a real, I don't even know what the catalyst for this was, but a real change in terms of the spending we're seeing. Um, but also like a, a really big vote of confidence to be like, no, this is the player that we're going to invest in. We're not going to try and find a cheaper alternative uh, somewhere out there. Well, I, I heard from Axel Schuster today because we did a little media roundtable. And I think in terms of like you point out the investments they're making and all of a sudden like, you know, the bags of money have come out in a way we've never seen before. And Schuster was describing how part of this process was essentially presenting like like you would a business proposal like not only is this a player that will benefit our team but here's similar players that have been bought into mls and how their their value has grown like it's it's almost viewed as an investment where not only we're going to get to use this guy on the pitch but like he's gonna bring in money for the club and we're going to be able to sell him on i mean you can even look at a guy that wasn't successful on the pitch like in bomb that was still a, a reasonably profitable venture for the Whitecaps. And so I think that this ownership group for whatever you think about them in, in, in a multitude of areas, they're more on board now. 
and and they're they're more trusting of some of the player personnel guys within the club to bring in players that are going to be financially viable and it's a i mean it's a delicate game because few clubs around the world are really capable of you know producing this like money making model in terms of player investment but it, it seems like the white caps are kind of going for it so it's a it's an interesting one to track because in a couple of years time we're, we're really going to get to see if it's if it's working or if it's not I think it's funny that you kind of describe it that way because I can absolutely see the you know original uh, management team solely looking at the team as to whether or not they're going to make money based on whether like if they're winning or not, as opposed to the investments that you're describing. And that's probably what the huge disconnect was over the past couple of years, not having someone like Schuster being like, look, it's not just about like winning or losing if we're buying and selling for the right amounts you know, like we did with Alfonso Davies, then we can make money. And it's not, it doesn't have to be like some uh, uh, diamond in the rough kind of thing, like Davies was. It could be something entirely different where if we put the time and effort into scouting properly, then we can like sell players, you know, a couple of years down the road. And that was probably something that was just never, it just never came to mind previously. It was more just hope for the best sign players and if we win then we can justify selling them for more as opposed to you know any other thought being put into it yeah it, it felt like before it was a g i hope we make the playoffs attitude and now it's like okay what's the five-year plan for the club you know how yeah. are we going to be financially prosperous and also have success in the field it, it feels like a more well-rounded approach and uh you know you can be you can be critical of axel schuster's background in certain areas uh, schalke has fallen completely apart recently so uh you know you can you can make what you want about that but he he does seem like a guy that kind of knows how to cross his t's and dot his i's and and i think that's something that's been lacking for a long time so it's good to see and that's the important thing too right like if he's able to explain it clearly then you know the purse opens up and or some someone who is. actually understands MLS roster rules, because like I feel like in the past, <laughs> the White Caps have been caught out on just like a basic lack of understanding. I think some other team got. Could, could, I mean, you're referring to the Breck Shea. You know, <laughs> we don't even have to say it, right? But, well, no, of course not. But I think some other team uh, also got caught out by one of those contracts from a player they signed from Orlando. So clearly, Orlando was like putting little traps in the contracts they were giving their players. It was quite strange. But I did want to jump off what Ian was saying is I, I don't really understand where this change in spending habits has come from. I, I appreciate it. But it was always like very strange to me that like, okay, the owners are trying to make money. That's fine. I'm not inherently opposed to that. But that, you know, just putting the weakest or not maybe not weakest per se, but the cheapest possible team out there is not necessarily the way to do that. Like I think about uh, like Atlanta with Almiron, like, yeah, they paid 13 million for him. It was a big investment, but they sold him for more than double that. So, I mean, you've got to spend money to make money is literally, it's, it's a term, it's a saying, it's a truism, people say it. And yet that seems to never have been applied before now. And now it is, and I'm happy. I don't know why it is. It's felt like, you know, the past couple of years here at, uh, you know, 86 forever, it's been mostly trying to bully the team into being a proper football club um and uh i mean i wasn't expecting that to be this successful but uh, we'll take credit for it well actually oh sorry yeah go ahead andrew well just real quick going off yeah spend money to make money i mean one thing though that is maybe worth discussing or dwelling on is did we overpay because 4.4 million for 60 percent i believe of his rights you know, you bet they're basically making a bet on their player development for a team that has not had not great player development. Uh, and I think, you know, looking at Inbum is kind of illustrative in that sense. You know, they're going to have to get him contributing in order to make a sizable profit. And I, I, it'll be interesting to see if they can pull that off. And I think player performance, I mean, it does come back to that one standpoint where as long as, like, you have to admit that the, if the team is doing well, then obviously players are developing. So that's, I mean, it's not like the original owner or original management group were wrong to think that way because it's it's all 
super intrinsic. Everything is really tied together in, in that regard. They're like, they're, you know, they're, how do you want to put it? The Venn diagram doesn't become a perfect circle, but there are enough overlaps to be like, well, development will be proven in the team being successful as well as just the individual performances. I mean, it, it's, it has to go both ways. That's just the way it is, I guess. I mean, I'd say we're on a good path considering how we finished last season. There seems to be an idea of what we can do and there's as much roster turnover this season, which is very nice to see for once. Um, so, I mean, I'm hoping that this is a, a planned purchase and there's a plan for utilizing him to the best of his ability.